Welcome, everybody. It's another episode of Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book. I watched two movies this week. We're doing Frozen. I watched Frozen 1 and 2. And I read The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. It's based on The Snow Queen. Everything's based on something. Isn't it crazy? Let's get into it. I had never seen Frozen before until uh, this past week. Never seen it at all. Obviously, it's been one of the like most talked about animated movies of recent memory. Highest grossing. Off the charts. The songs are everywhere. I know the songs. I've never seen the movie until now. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's, it's just not quite been my, I don't know, that's not one I'm lining <laughs> up to see, I guess. But I love that people love it. I love what, I love people loving things. <laughs> I just love people loving things, Taylor. I know. And hopefully, if you're listening to this, you've gotten a sense that Evan is all about people being about their things. Man, I love it when somebody <laughs> finds their thing. Then you know what? Frozen is so many people's thing. I don't think many people know that it was based on The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen. Not at all. One of his longer ones, novella size, because he did fairy tales, this and that. He did a bunch of stuff. Mostly what he's known for is The Little Mermaid was also his. Oh! But there's a lot, which Disney Ooh. adapted. <laughs> Just a little... <laughs> Just a little mm, thing. But there's a lot of other ones that he did. This came out in 1844. So real old. Wow. I yeah. did not know. I didn't know it was that. I was thinking. I'm just in my, you know, <laughs> my unlearned, my illiterate self. I was like, oh, you know, probably written in like the 30s or something. You know, <laughs> The other thing, this has already had five film adaptations. Whoa, if what? If you can believe that. So Y'all didn't know that. <laughs> the first one was in 1957, Soviet animated film. I'll post a link on YouTube. It's the full thing is there. Oh, fascinating. In the original Russian. Yeah. And what's interesting about this, which we'll get into how he ties into the Disney version, but this film was a huge inspiration for Hayao Miyazaki, who runs Studio Ghibli. Uh, he was not going to go into animation, was struggling in his early career, and then had watched this, and this encouraged him to keep on going. So the bloodlines in Frozen, the, if you trace it back, those same bloodlines help inspire... A Japanese uh, the mo One of the most amazing mm -hmm. animated artists ever. Totoro, Spirited Away, yeah. I could go on. All that stuff. That's pretty amazing. So you can watch this film on YouTube. It's I think it's an hour long. And then we have 67. There's a Soviet version, but it's live action. Hmm. And then in 86, there was a live action version that was made in Finland. And this was submitted for the best foreign language film at the 60th Oscars, though it did oh, really? not get nominated. In 1995, there's a British animated film that has Helen Mirren voicing the Snow Queen. Oh. And then in 2012, there's a Russian animated adaptation that has four parts. It's All now a four-part series. Which is interesting because Frozen came out. In 2014? In 2014. But I, I remember. It, yeah. <laughs> there's I remember also, it snowed yeah. that Christmas and people lost their minds <laughs> like, over this soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> there's also been 12 TV adaptations of various kinds there's been five operas six plays and musicals and five ballets and now is all this pre frozen yes, or is this yes, including yes. Frozen? this is all based on the snow queen I, what i mean the numbers you just gave is this including all the frozen branded stuff or no. is this just before well, one, of, of one of no one of the musicals is gotcha. the frozen musical but everything gotcha. else is based on hans christian anderson's original thing how Very, in the world did Disney keep a lid on, on this? Because I had no idea this was based on anything. Yeah, so I'll, we'll get into at the yeah, yeah. end how Disney, this has been a long and tumultuous process since the start of Disney feature film animation. They've Which been trying to make We've touched on it a little bit about, we go back to our, our Lion King episode. <laughs> There's some little, little bit of, you want some flavor there of what goes on. So the idea behind it is completely different in the Disney. The only thing that's really the same is there's a Snow Queen who is able to control winter weather and plunges this land into winter. Well, no it. more characters? Or is the Anna character there? Is the Snow Queen is able to make people's hearts turn to ice, and there's this... Tight. Starts out with literally the devil, Satan, in Casual. the translation, <laughs> is, is a hobgoblin or a demon or whatever. But he has this mirror that you l look at it, it, it shows you all the bad things. Like it's a pessimistic mirror almost. Hmm. Like instead of seeing a, no, a no. beautiful rose, it's a wilted thing with worms. And instead of seeing your friend, it's a gross. You could just get mad at them because they do annoying no. stuff. Smash it. So, well, that's bad what he did. Mirror. He smashed it. And then all the little shards are flittering all around. And if it, it could get lodged in your eye oh. and you could see things differently or get lodged in your heart. 
Uh. And you it might turn to ice over time. So that's what happens to the main character. And then the Snow Queen uses this in the winter. But that's really the only thing that might be sort of similar. And no the, more characters at all. It's all no. wow. There's a reindeer that talks. Okay. Which I Spin. but that reindeer doesn't talk. He doesn't and see they make a point that he doesn't talk. <laughs> they make a point that that Kristoff voices him, which is kind of funny for these yeah. movies because you know mm-hmm. I just want to quickly say Writing a mad a, a, a musical animated magical film must be just so liberating because you can do anything at any moment. Because there's no reason this reindeer shouldn't talk, but they go out of their way <laughs> to have another character that's what voice him, only to then have him voice himself mm-hmm. in the in the second one. There's like there's you know in the middle of a musical thing, he has like a crazy dream where Sven is actually singing back to him, mm-hmm. and it's supposed to be kind of trippy because that doesn't happen. Mm. But that is like, what they I guess do anything for any reason. In- mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's what they have done, I guess, with Frozen and Frozen 2 is take what Disney is known for with the traditional fairy tales, princess falls in love with the prince and has to save whatever. We know kind of those beats and those story elements, and they definitely switched it around. Well, definitely the for the for the first one, man, because yeah. I thought I thought it was headed in, in one direction. I think everybody's kind of sitting there at the last few minutes thinking, mm-hmm. oh, you know, an act of true love, got to get to Kristoff or whatever. <laughs> but then, no, an act of true love can come from your sister, can come from your brother for mm-hmm. it, it just love 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 it can be anything mm-hmm. it doesn't have it doesn't have to be romantic love yeah uh and and bringing it home to be a story about sisters was just oh oh that's great that's great this isn't a love story this isn't a romance this is a sister movie mm-hmm. incredible and i'm only realizing that you know really i mean i knew that all the way through mm-hmm. but 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 really i'll go oh it really is that mm-hmm. at the right at the last minute the most precise moment and that's i think why it's so I mean, so heavily revered. I mean, it's yeah. just kind of coming out of nowhere uh, with this turn that really makes me go, oh, I really like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and the uh, way Hans Christian Andersen played around with the form in this story particularly, like the Snow Queen doesn't get her due at the end. She's responsible for this chaos. The devil that sprays these shards everywhere that makes people all negative, nothing mm-hmm. happens to him. Mm-hmm. It's just revealed at the beginning that he did this wacky thing mm-hmm. and all this bad stuff happened to people. And so be it. He's just the Charlie Manson of fairy tale writers. <laughs> Whatever it is, it is. Yeah. It doesn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> and so at the time, people he wasn't initially revered, and then he was for, for all those other things. But that's why people like his fairy tales, is because there's more of a human element to them. Uh-huh. There is a moral lesson, but it usually involves people doing it on their own, which I do think has a lot to do with the Frozen the, as it stands now. The sentimentality behind it mm, is yeah. go your own way, figure yourself out, don't depend on other people, because that's yeah. how he ended up doing. But you were saying off mic that the second one falters a little bit in that regard. They, with Elsa, they have her looking for more answers as to why she is who, what she is, who mm-hmm. she is. But they run with this theme of, you know, it's great to look into your past. It's great to know who you are and where you come from. All that stuff is incredibly valuable. It can be really enriching. But it's not everything, and it's not your life now. It's not where you're going. Um, and so they, they run with this with, with Elsa's that you could go too far. So by the at all, about the the same precise moment in time, you know, structurally for the second movie compared to the first one, they've got all their characters in the second film in really great positions. Uh, and so I'm I'm sitting there not as an audience member going, oh my god, everybody's you know stretched, all, you know, like Elsa's across the sea that she had yeah. to tame this amazing uh, water horse to to get to this other magical land. Like how is how is Anna ever going to get there? Oh, well, she's got to get to Kristoff. Okay, so maybe their love is useful for something because it's going to be together. They're going to be able to get to Elsa to get mm-hmm. the magic back to them. But how are they going to figure all this? How out? are they going right. to? Fi- I'm like, oh my god, I'm buckling up for the next. You know, I'm buckling up for at least another fifty minutes. When all of a sudden, Anna just kind of knows the answer. She's got to. Mm. She, and I don't want to just like throw it out there for everybody. You know, but yeah. But she just kind of knows the answer. She has to go. She has to go fix the right, the right, the the Thing. big wrong, and it just kind of. Uh, uh, comes to her and and this fixing this wrong then fixes everything suddenly <laughs> elsa is is you know Fine. back in the game yeah. and now she's able to stop the impending doom coming down on irwindale immediately without anybody talking it all happens all at once and so i felt like oh man they've got they've worked 
most of this movie to get their characters in such an incredible place. Everybody's on the outs. I don't know how everybody's going to reconvene. This is drama. This is great. Oh, this is this is the makings of a great movie. How are we going to get everybody together? How are we going to mm. accomplish? How are we going to get over this hill? And then everybody just comes together. They start checking boxes is how it felt. And it was mm. really underwhelming for the last 20 minutes of just it felt like they're going down the line going yep answered yeah. that she fixes this and Elsa comes back and uh, and they just don't People do knew. it and they, they just, just start checking yeah. off boxes and the movie's over and I was really really kind of taken aback by that with how good the the last act of the first one was I was mm-hmm. really not I was really not into it for the last act of this one there is in the original story I wrote down a quote because this uh, girl, Gerda, the, her friend Kay, which is this kid, they're both kids, gets taken by the Snow Queen and his heart turns to ice. And the whole fairy tale is her trying to get to him, okay. to get him back from the Snow Queen. And she has basically a series of different challenges, kind of like the Odyssey. In one of them, she encounters these old women and they're deciding, should we give her, we have this potion to give her the, the strength of 12 men. Mm. And they say... Don't give her anything. And the quote is, I can't give her greater power than she already has. Can't you see how great that is? Can't you see how humans and animals have to serve her? How she has managed to get so far in the world on her own bare feet. Mm. So they don't, they just give her clothes and the reindeer and they're like, off you go. Which I think ties a lot into what the original one had to do with. I just didn't really, I didn't feel the resolve. I didn't understand what that, all that meant. Other, you know, uh, just the, the bare bones of... Oh, you're where you're 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 where you're supposed to be, and we can grow and change, and it still and it just be a new version of the things that we love. It doesn't mean that the things that we love are gone or change. And then I feel like that's really reaching for it, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, to be yeah. fair, uh, I was really disappointed just yeah. by the end of it. Just the end, though, and maybe I maybe I missed some stuff. If you're fans of the, you know, <laughs> and. If you happen to be fans of this little movie, <laughs> you might want to check this one this out. This movie, which was, had the highest, highest all-time worldwide opening of any animated film, and was, uh. is already the ninth highest grossing film of this year. <laughs> also, just as a little side note, because I thought this was bizarre, South Korea, the government, filed a complaint against Disney and is having a lawsuit currently because Frozen 2 occupied 88% of all movie screens, which violates their anti-monopoly laws. Because <laughs> um, you can't have more than 50% of anything. That's a, then, then it's a monopoly. Oh, my God. <laughs> and they took 88% of screens. So they're in trouble Monopoly on the we'll screen, see. boy. <laughs> yeah, no matter what. Yeah, there's an 88% chance that you were going to see Frozen <laughs> in South Korea. <laughs> they love well, it. Well, sp- speaking of monopolies, though. Let's talk about Hans Christian Andersen. How in the world Disney decided to go off of this weird thing? Because yeah, it seems where like did he go to? About it. <laughs> and who he is and how he's the monopoly of fairy tales. And then uh, we'll talk about how Disney picked up on this and how it's been quite the journey for them to come up with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hans, old. He was born in 1805. He's Danish, Denmark, Copenhagen. His father was a shoemaker, poor. His mother was an illiterate washerwoman. Illiterate. Illiterate. So what did he do? He spent his time listening while his friends were out gallivanting around. He went to the insane asylum in the town and listened to crazy people, (laughs) which kind of reminded me of Dr. Seuss and how he would wander around the zoo that his father had. Shout out to our Dr. Seuss episode. Yo, yo. And that's how he built his interest in these things. And his mother and his grandmother would tell him stories. His father read to him Arabian Nights, A Thousand and One Nights. Mm -hmm. He wrote over 200 fairy tales in the course of his life. What's interesting about him versus other things, like Brothers Grimm also were around this time that did Snow White, that did Hansel and Gretel. They were German academics and educators, and they were more interested in the literary retelling of existing tales and the lineage of Mm. that. Hans Christian Andersen, like I said, he had almost 200 tales. Historians estimate that only seven of those were borrowed. All the others are original. Wow. So that's why he's the master Prolific, in this maybe. time frame, even though Grimm are around the same time. He hated school so much as a kid. Uh, he was abused. He was driven into depression. Mm. The only way that you could go was by getting patronage. So he got patronage to pay for it by the director of a royal theater. But this was so further along, the only way he could do it is if he was alongside 11-year-olds and he was 17 years old. Oh, man. And it was just a nightmare. He hated it so much. Oh, so a lot gosh. of his fairy tales are about feeling like 
you don't belong or feeling like the education system is failing and you got to do it on your own. Like I said, one of his other most famous stories is the ugly duckling. Oh God. Which he came about because it was a, it was a swan well, who was with the ducks. Yeah. He wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> his first story came out in 1829. Didn't do that well. He got a grant from the King f- to travel and write. So well, he has actually written a lot of poems and travel logs, stories about him going around all over Europe and what he saw. Hmm. One of them is called a picture book without pictures. Hmm. Um, Then he started. 1835, he came out with the big stories. In the same book, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Little Mermaid, The Princess and the Pea, The Ugly Duckling. He balled out on him. Sold really poorly, though. Didn't do that well. You just was (laughs) Nobody (laughs) wanted him. He was publishing volumes all the way through 1845, so for 10 more years. Only when it got picked up by international periodicals and magazines and jumping on that game did it get any attention. Oh, man. So now he's blowing up after the 10 years of fairy tales. In 1847, he traveled to England and met one of his favorite people who he was inspired by, Charles Dickens. Oh. And because they both have a poor upbringing, have sympathy for the poor and children specifically. How did he he meet him? How did he- Just hung out with him. Yeah, because they were both popular. They were both famous. Gotcha, okay. By this point. They're in the club. Mm -hmm. And then after this, he continues until his death in 1872. So for 37 more years, he's writing fairy tales- and all of that. Because we're always curious about this. Like, how? Yeah. The Danish government paid him an annual stipend as a, quote, national treasure. So, like, the king that gave him the grant to travel around. like once... where, you get, where do you apply for that? <laughs> <laughs> they loved it. Well, because he was balling out internationally. All his stories were super successful. One part of his history that is currently under review, I suppose, by historians was his sexuality because he never got married, which was bizarre for the time Hmm. throughout his whole life. And he was fascinated with different people and had written letters. And some argue that he was probably bisexual because Hmm. he has letters written to men and women, which was not uncommon at the time. But specifically to the men, there were complications with his sexual urges because you would he would write Interesting. you know George Washington wrote letters saying that he loved people and sure. this and that but it was very more specific that both men and women were rejecting his advances wow. which is also confusing because a lot of his stories are very religious or embody a lot of christian themes yeah. but there was always complications with his love life That's fascinating Specifically, one interesting person who they say the Snow Queen might have been modeled off of, which is mm. a myth. There was a Swedish opera singer that he was infatuated with mm. called Jenny Lind. And she's the gal, if you've seen uh, the movie The Greatest Showman about P.T. Barnum, who then he oh. takes her on the tour of America yeah. to promote. He was infatuated with her. Of course, she rejected him. It was like, I think of him as a friend, this and that. Yeah. But how interesting was her. Uh, poor dude. Poor dude. And then looking uh, for love. <laughs> looking for love. Men and women. Nobody Anybody. giving it to him. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you. Huh? But the big thing why he's so famous then is because it's described as children's stories for children's sake. Like I said, the OG Dr. Seuss. Not like Grimm's academic interest, not in the morality tales. They're just good stories Mm -hmm. for kids, which he still relates to. His legacy extends into the real world, close to where we are, where Evan and I are. There's a city called Solvang in California. Solvang. That is entirely Dutch. It's like Irwindale, which I wanted to call it. Right. (laughs) Arendelle. Arendelle. It's basically a mini Arendelle. It's entirely Danish. They've got all the architecture. There's a Hans Christian (gasps) Andersen park. They love the Little Mermaid. (laughs) <laughs> I visited. I vi- they, they all love the Little Mermaid. <laughs> I visited it before. It's fascinating. It really? looks like a little. It looks like a little mini Copenhagen kind of place oh, in the middle of California. And then there is a, the strangest thing I've seen, which I'll post a link to an article because this guy actually goes there and makes a mockery of it. It's called Anderson Park, and it's outside of Shanghai. It's in China. Cost millions of dollars to make, but it's themed around the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen. But it's like this weird, bizarre Chernobyl esque ghost town of a theme park that's that's operating (laughs) came out in the late 2000s they finally finished it but it's just really weird (laughs) it's like a glorified (laughs) playground and there's this prefabricated castle looking thing but if you look at a wide shot of it it's like in this desolate industrial park wasteland (laughs) but it's like i built that on the sims yeah yeah thought about it yeah (laughs) (laughs) oh god come back in five years people are going to it it's basically what it is 
and there's statues of him. There's one. There's a statue of him in Central Park with the ugly duckling next to him. There's, oh. there's a statue of him. There's millions of statues of him in Copenhagen. Hmm. That's his legacy. Like I said, the original fairy tales, Gosh. which Disney then took. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so how did Disney get into this? They actually planned a biographical film about Hans Christian Andersen's life really? in late 1937. This was even before oh, Snow White wow. and the Seven Dwarves. Oh. They wanted to make this live, fans, huh? live action animated hybrid about his life. Walt Disney is the worst fan to have because he'll just take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he'll just take it and, uh, and it's his now. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> and no one uh, – you did nothing. Uh, and no one knows who you are. Bye-bye. Well, so what happened was – Somebody else did take it from him. This is uh, Hans Christian Andersen's life. They, Because like I said, they wanted to do it a half live action, half animated biography, biopic kind of thing. They were going to, he was talking. It's going to be, premiere at the World's Fair. It's going to be the most amazing cinematic performance you've ever seen. In CinemaScope in 7D. <laughs> he, he talked to, had talks with Sam Goldwyn, which is the G in MGM, to make this. <laughs> Plans fell apart about in because of 1942 World War II. I'm the G in MGM. <laughs> what I say goes. So they weren't able to do it because of World War II. Goldwyn ended up making the live action part, and it's called Hans Christian Andersen. Came out in 1952. Stars Danny Kaye, who was big on dancing. I'll post a link to the trailer. Had six Academy Award nominations. God. So they did it, but it had no animated part to it. The wacky parts. So. Ah. Then Disney was like, ah, screw it. So they, they shelved all the Hans Christian Andersen stuff in the late – in 1990s after the, what we call the Disney Renaissance where they took – the start of it was The Little Mermaid, mm -hmm. which was Hans Christian mm -hmm. Andersen's stories. They were like, well, we're going to go back to some of his stuff. So they go back to The Snow Queen, got scrapped in 2002, tried it with a few people. This guy Chris Buck comes in in 2008 who did Tarzan. He did Surf's Up for Sony. He, he had left gotcha. Disney and worked for Sony. Then they were like, please come back. Then in 2010 – completely scrapped 2011 they did tangled which was kind of like rapunzel and they were like oh maybe right. the disney princess cgi thing is going to come back sisters are rarely used in american films so that yeah. was kind of the hook yeah the only even in american films not just animated or disney like the only other one that they had done before was lilo and stitch oh, was the two yeah. sisters which was really really well done that, yeah so what they decided, they had a thing called, which reminded me of Hans Christian Andersen when he was going to listen to people at the Insane Asylum, yeah. or just that's how he absorbed information, was him traveling around, getting the boots on the ground. Yeah. Disney had a thing called the Sister Summit, where they had women from all over the studio who had sisters come in and talk about their relationships with their sisters. Oh my gosh. And what that meant to them. Oh, so that man. was the research. Hugely important. I mean, Huge. Hugely impactful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Jennifer Lee, who was working on Wreck-It Ralph was brought in to become the writer. They have 17 months to make the thing because they were announced it was going to be done in 2013 Oops. of November. <laughs> and in a strange turn of events, Jennifer Lee and this Chris Buck guy who's co-directing it with her, mm -hmm. they said they were inspired by Hayao Miyazaki for the epicness it of his animated around. features. Little do we know now that he was inspired by the original. They were inspired queen. by his inspiration <laughs> by their inspiration. <laughs> That's welcome to a letter. It's amazing. Everything's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Along with all of the crazy research now they're doing, they're like, we got to get it done in 17 months. We got to learn everything about everything. There were animators that were dispatched to Wyoming to traipse around in snow in long clothes to figure out how ah. all of that. They developed an entirely, I don't know what it's called, algorithmic engine or whatever for snow specifically for this film because there's all different kinds of snow and how it interacts. Mm -hmm. um, they had lighting teams that went to visit Quebec artists that went to Norway for building the ice palace yeah. the scene in the first one where it's all being constructed. Yeah. That was based on the fractals of snowflakes. It took 30 hours to render each frame oh in that gosh. sequence. In the process of this, they hooked up with Robert Lopez and his wife to develop the music mm -hmm. for the first one. Mm -hmm. Imagine all of this is happening in tandem, rewriting the script, getting the months. voices. They got to do it. This Robert Lopez guy, I didn't know anything about him. He's very, very understated when it comes to social media and putting himself out there. Really? He is one of only 15 people to win what they call the EGOT, which is an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. On that low key, though. He is the youngest person. He is the quickest person. He won all of them in 10 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he is the only person to win all four more than once. Whoa. He has multiple EGOTs? He worked this on- This guy's a machine. As far as musicals, he worked on Avenue Q and the Book of Mormon. 
Oh, wow. For animated films, did the music for Let It Go one, and then he also did Remember Me, the film Coco. Oh, yeah. That song yeah, he was yeah, in charge yeah. of. And then the show The Wonder Pets on Nickelodeon won Emmys. I've never heard of that one. Yeah. Just insane. So they're working. He lives in New York, and this is in. So they're doing two hour telecommunication conferences every single day Bananas. for all this time. They ended up writing 25 songs for this oh film. Gosh. There's only eight that are in the final version. I'm sure they just scrape some more into this in the next one. Yeah, yeah. Was a nice, hold on. We'll just wait a few months. We'll see you about uh, bringing everybody back for the sequel. Use the same bars. Uh, <laughs> they had no idea that this was going to be what it was. Like, this is a crazy hodgepodge I bet, yeah. production of all these elements being put in. It was what they called Elsa's badass song that then got turned into Let It Go. That was the unlock for the writing. Mm, that then they realized, oh, sense. this is what it's about. Yeah, they heard yeah, the song. Yeah. They, they, they wrote this song and... It just came out. Then it came out. Then it exploded. It just needed to exist. The legacy of this. In 2014, Elsa was number 88 on the most used baby name. And this is the really? first time this ever appeared on baby name charts. Oh, man. Definitely. That's how you know you had an impact. <laughs> because of this movie. <laughs> we actually know Elsa. Uh, they brought a live action Elsa into their, what was the, there's a Disney. Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time. The actress yeah. that played Elsa went to school with us at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how incredible. And, and. I worked uh, in an office next to Josh Gad, who voices Olaf. How about he that? stole LaCroix out of my <laughs> refrigerator and looked lost on purpose. I never took it back. Piece uh, of trash. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's, a great, he, he's a great Olaf. The other person, which is worth mentioning, is Jennifer Lee, who I said was brought on from Wreck-It Ralph. She is the first film director of a Walt Disney animated film who is female. Outright. The first of all the films that director. Disney have made wow. that are animated, she is the first woman. And she is the first female director to earn more than a billion dollars uh, in a movie that yeah. made a billion dollars. And she's the one that came about with the whole sisters thing. Really? You know? Because yeah, she I was mean, like, the sisters oh. is, it, that's the whole reason this is, this is worth, worth seeing, worth, you know, feeling to me. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a sister story. And that's her sister who is estranged with her. Ended up walking with her on the red carpet and all that. It was like, oh, it's brought them back together. But just a wild whirlwind turn of events, which almost sounds like the second movie. Like, how is everybody going to fit all this together? Yeah. And like I said, they were flabbergasted by the popularity of Frozen and how it kept going. And they were like, we, you know, we were just trying to make something a little bit better than Tangled. <laughs> we were not, <laughs> we didn't think this was going to be the, the second Disney renaissance. I'm just thinking about... How beautiful it is that a story can change so many people's lives. Uh, you know, Hans coming up with this, and he has a really troubled life in his own right. But now, look, he's got statues all over the world. Um, yeah. That's kind of insane. So that he created this little story that then got comported and changed and became an incredible monument for the for the film industry for women in film mm -hmm. uh, it's a turning point in disney's future for what how this formula is going to continue and exist in the future is you know the, hearing the, the the weird parallels between the director and her sister and the sisters in the mm -hmm. film the sister aspect how important that is that that aspect is front and center in these listening stories. to other people's stories it's just fascinating to me that this one dude's story has kind of sparked all of this and, you know, sparked Miyazaki, which then came <laughs> back around to then re-inspire itself, you know, and yeah. I, I made a joke about this with mm -hmm. one of them about just like, it feels like the Terminator incepting itself through time because it must exist. It must mm -hmm. do these things for these people. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, where did the, where did the story come from? So how did cyclical. it, how did do it, how did it do this for these people? Oh my God. You know, and that's yeah. just the beauty of a story is it can come out of nowhere and it can change it can change your life mm -hmm. and, and it can just pass through generations. This guy who couldn't find love on the street now has bronze statues <laughs> all over the globe. In, like in, that. Yeah. But it's the beauty of a story. And when you find a good one, someone, something that touches and res resonates, mm -hmm. uh, it's just the, 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 the magnificence in that is, is just amazing. That's what the show consistently, mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to, to dredge up that. <laughs> what um, are the connections between things? The big thing that Hans, was known for, which he revolutionized in stories and the fairy tale world, was giving things a soul, personifying mm -hmm. things. He mm -hmm. had his earliest story, which was just found out about recently, was about this candlestick who was alive and the plight of, of that character. And not many people were 
just thinking about what would an inanimate object be thinking about or feeling about or using that as a literary device. Yeah. And that's ultimately what these stories well, are doing is that, giving that really is actually what you just said kind of struck me because I remember as a child I always had a real trepidation about my objects and and specifically throwing things away because I I was afraid of what the thing might feel like mm -hmm. it's like it's just gonna go sit in a landfill forever but like but personifying and identifying and, yeah. and caring for inanimate objects a very childlike thing uh, you know obviously i've matured and moved past that now but it still is a very visceral feeling to me when i am reminded of that of like mm -hmm. well things still exist it's yeah. just the, the child perspective is is really really important it's not easy to emulate and so when somebody can actually put their thumb on that and use it and harness it uh, that's mm -hmm. pretty incredible. The original Dr. Seuss. Go check out Frozen. You probably already have. Yeah, you got it. I got the I got the Blu-ray right here. <laughs> Heaven will be watching it every day. Oh man. I know. I'm excited. Next week we're doing The Irishman. What's the title of the book? I heard you paint houses. I heard you paint houses. Which is the mob code. term for <laughs> you're gonna die. Or whatever. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. The Martin Scorsese straight to Netflix gamble. Everybody's talking about it. We will be covering it next week, baby. I'm excited. If, if you ever want to reach out to us, let us know what you thought. Let us know what we should be talking about. Yeah. At IlliteratePod on Instagram. Send us a message. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it.